Our next speaker is Dr. Sherman Silver. Dr. Sherman Silver is a renowned pioneer in microsurgery and infertility, is considered one of the world's leading authorities on IVF, mini IVF, sperm retrieval, ICSI, vasectomy reversal, male infertility, tubal ligation reversal, egg and embryo freezing, ovary transplantation, and the reproductive biology clock. For over 38 years, Dr. Silber has originally developed all of the most popular fertility treatments used all over the world today. For this meeting, I asked Dr. Silber to discuss with us the topic, mechanism of primordial follicle recruitment, the truth about ovarian rejuvenation. So Sherman, please go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Zev. I appreciate being invited and uh, talking about what is now my favorite subject. Now, we know that uh, ovarian follicle recruitment is the basis of ovarian longevity, and it's been controversial for many years. And because of some of the recent uh, papers, uh, there's a lot of talk about ovarian rejuvenation. And uh, I'm going to give you the truth about that, and we'll end up a little bit with in vitro gametogenesis which I think is getting within reach. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to talk in great depth about it, but people can email me at that email address below and we can talk about many aspects of this in the future. Uh, it all started with our paper in 2005 in the New England Journal of Medicine with the first ovary transplant between monozygotic twins discordant for premature ovarian failure. And it created quite a bit of excitement. But understand that we first started freezing ovary tissue for cancer patients uh, with the instruction of Roger Gosden in 1997. So this has uh, been a really long journey we've taken, but the first paper that showed we were headed in the right direction was fresh ovary transplantation with monozygotic twins. Now, this is almost a six part lecture series. I, I, that's why I say I can't really go into all the depth I wanna go into. But it involves ovary freezing and transplantation and how we came to in vitro maturation. And we really have a robust method of this now. Uh, and that's because we use the principles of in vitro gametogenesis and ovarian longevity. And we're even doing ovarian allografting between sisters that are not identical now. And we'll, we're working on in vitro gametogenesis in the human, and we're almost halfway there. Uh, these are all important subjects, but I'd like to just, uh, I guess, really explain ovarian longevity better and the confusion and the myths uh, about uh, ovarian rejuvenation. So we're going to talk, this is a picture of our first uh, ovary tissue transplant, and we'll talk about ovarian longevity, in vitro maturation, which is very robust now, and making eggs from skin biopsy. And I'll, I'll make some outrageous statements that there's no real need for the ovulatory cycle except for one egg getting out at a time. And there's no real need for ovarian stimulation except to get the eggs out of the ovary because all the maturation and the genetics take place uh, naturally without the need for those processes. So this is all based on work with uh, Katsuhiko Hayashi, uh, who I'm sure one day will get the Nobel Prize, and I'm sort of the clinical tag along, so he gets the credit for all of this. Uh, and uh, we, we're continuing to work on it. Uh, now, helping us on the human side is Amanda Clark at the UCLA Stem Cell Center, and uh, Kyle Orwick from the University of Pittsburgh. And so this is a, uh, a really a four-way collaboration, and I'm simply the clinician. Uh, that provides the material and uh, apl applies this uh, in translation uh, to, to translate it. Uh, for the, we do a skin biopsy on all our women now with uh, ovarian failure and even azospermic men. And you can see it's just a tiny little nothing procedure that nobody minds. And uh, from those skin cells, we're making uh, stem cells and that's the beginning of in vitro gametogenesis. But our first paper on ovary transplantation followed very closely the principles of Roger Gosden. And uh, this is just a view of it from the New England Journal of Medicine. And the particular technique we use, as it turns out, is very important. 
So here's a good example. Crystal's eggs were quite fertile until she was 46 years old, believe it or not, but uh, 46 years old, but Bonnie was born with no eggs. And we want, our question was really not a practical one, like uh, how do we uh, do in vitro gametogenesis or in vitro maturation? Our question was just a, um, a scientific one. Uh, how could it be that you had these identical twin sisters and one was born with ovarian failure and the other had a, a very high ovarian reserve and was very fertile? Uh, what could be the cause of this? And in fact, uh, we transplanted the tissue. And like I said before, eight years later at age 46, uh, it, it, she's, uh, she still had babies. So she had three babies, the oldest one at age 46. Now at age four, 55, we actually have made PGCs from her skin biopsy much later than 40, age 46 when she was 55 years old. And these are young PGCs, it's recreating uh, embryology actually. So we reported the uh, production of these PGCs in uh, Bonnie. She's a 55 year old woman, previously uh, fertile really. Uh, and uh, both she and her sister generated normal PGCs from a 55 year old skin cells. So think about this uh, with this area of research. In the future, if we're really successful in going beyond PGCs, in the future, a 38-year-old woman might be better off having a skin biopsy than an oocyte retrieval for IBF because we'll get really, really young eggs out of this. But we wanted to know when does PGC specification occur? I mean, it wasn't a practical translational thing we were thinking about. It was purely a scientific question. Uh, and since we knew the uh, obstetric history of these twins that were discordant for ovarian failure, we knew if they were mono-mono or mono-di or di-di, we could figure out what in the human, never been done before, would be the time in the embryo of PGC specification. Now you see what happens is this is a mouse picture and there are a group of cells in the very early epiblast, you can see they're staying green. Uh, that are destined to become PGCs. They can't become anything else. And uh, this is clear in the mouse, but what about in the human? Well, now we know, we didn't know before that this occurs between day nine and day 12. And here's the reason, uh, well, I'll show you the reason why in a minute. Uh, here is a, a, the summary of these twins that uh, we had premature ovarian failure and we now have young PGCs on them. But this is the diagram I wanted to show you. Uh, we know that the twinning had to occur after the time of PGC specification uh, because otherwise there wouldn't have been a misallocation of uh, germ cells from one twin to the other. The reason we know that it's a misallocation of, sperm cell, of germ cells that caused the ovarian failure is because uh, we were able to generate uh, perfectly normal germline stem cells, even from the uh, twin who had ovarian failure. So there was, there was no genetic reason why uh, she would have no eggs. So the only remaining explanation is misallocation of germ cells at the time of splitting. And since we know these, they were all mono mono uh, and uh, the, uh, Two, only 2% 2 of identical twins are mono-mono, and these women were all mono-mono. So what, what happened is we know that splitting occurred uh, in these cases after PGC specification, which now we know is between day nine and 12 and closer to day nine. So that was just interesting. It, it was, we weren't trying to uh, create any fantastic technology at that time that was gonna help fertile couples. We just thought we had material that allowed us to answer a fascinating question. But once we did that, we wanted to get more into translational. And what about over, sorry, I didn't, uh, I, I didn't do that right. Let me get this back again. Okay, so all this material is published now in RBM Online just uh, this month, and uh, you'll be able to look up the details in the manuscript, uh, but I'll try to give you an understanding. First, in the summary, we have pretty spectacular results with ovary transplantation. We have 11 babies from seven of nine fresh transplants, 78%, and uh, 19 babies from... Uh, uh, 13 of 17 transplants, and 
uh, three from six vitrified and 16 from 11 slow free. So we have 30 healthy babies from ovary transplant and not a single one of them involved IVF. Uh, the baby, the pregnancy rate is quite remarkable, certainly over 70%, whether fresh or frozen. And so we believe it has to do with the fact that uh, IVF is very difficult in these cases. There's a low ovarian reserve and better off to let the woman ovulate every month and get pregnant naturally. We'll get into that later. This is a busy slide just summarizing all the uh, frozen transplants. Uh, and with the first freezing being back in 1997, uh, it takes a long time for these women to come back uh, and have their baby. And, uh, uh, you know, they had their freeze maybe when they were 17 with cancer and they come back when they're in their 40s. So it takes a long time to accumulate such a series. But the question is, how does it work and why does it work? Well, we all know that primordial follicles are all located in the cortex and they're very resistant uh, to, uh, to freezing damage because they're small and uh, they're not in a metaphase plate. And so uh, they can be, even when eggs couldn't be frozen, we just couldn't freeze metaphase two eggs, but uh, we could easily freeze these resting follicles just by freezing the outer cortex of the ovarian tissue. But notice what uh, many uh, uh, REs don't really understand exactly how the ovary works and we didn't either. But the resting follicles are on the outside and they develop into secondary follicles and graphene follicles toward the soft inside. And then once they get big enough, they burst through the epithelium uh, as uh, graphene follicles that ovulate but really they're developing toward the soft inside, towards the medulla. And that, and the question is what controls this recruitment of a thousand resting follicles every month, 13, sorry, 30 a day. And what is it prevents all the uh, eggs that have gone into meiosis in the early fetus, what prevents them from all completing meiosis and dying and the little girl born with nothing? So uh, the ovarian cortex tissue is not hospitable to metastasis. So that helps us with ovary transplantation. Um, and, uh, but you can see it's all located in the densest fibrous tissue in the body. Uh, anatomists have studied this and there is no denser fibrous tissue in the body than the ovarian cortex, but it's a density gradient. And it's that pressure gradient that controls the gradual release of these resting follicles recruitment from the resting phase. So we prepare the ovary cortex slices and, uh, to be very thin. And we know that fresh human tissue pre-freeze and post-freeze uh, with vitrification shows no difference. The follicles are not hurt by that. And uh, by way of technique, we uh, quilt the uh, thawed pieces together uh, so that we can just do one transplant and put that transplant right on the denuded uh, cortex uh, that, from the dead ovary, always in a position where the fallopian tube can pick up the egg easily because we're, we're relying on natural pregnancy because IVF is so difficult with these cases. And I think that's one reason we have such a high success rate. So this I showed you before, 46 years old, three babies from an ovary transplant from a sister. This is a, a young woman who had terrible Hodgkin's disease, two bone marrow transplants, and she has four babies, all naturally conceived from her frozen ovary graft uh, 20 years later. And we even have uh, three leukemia cases resulting in six babies. And we were willing to do that for two reasons. One is that uh, there is very little uh, metastasis to the uh, ovarian cortex because it's not a very welcoming area with dense fibrous tissue, but also because uh, Klaus Anderson showed that if you remove the ovary, uh, when the uh, leukemia is in remission, there won't be viable leukemic cells. And so we've had no uh, transmission of leukemia. We have six healthy babies uh, from leukemia patients. This is the first one we did in 1997 when she was 24 years old. At age 41, she decided to get to have a baby and try to get pregnant and the tissue was transplanted back. Now, what's interesting is you can see that there's an area of damage uh, to the resting follicles because her uh, ovary was removed after she had her initial chemo and put her in remission. But it didn't destroy all the primordial follicles, but it certainly destroyed all the cancer cells. So, 
The remaining residual left over in menopausal after bone marrow transplant, no cancer cells, not surprisingly, but there are still rare healthy primordial follicles even in someone that has had the bone marrow transplant. Let me show you this. You can see a rare follicle in, in this tissue. And so the question is, why aren't they getting out? Why is she menopausal? And what really is rejuvenation? Why are we, we're mixed up. There's myths about rejuvenation. Uh, and I'll explain to you how those myths develop. But first, let me just show you her picture with her baby. There she is, a 24-year-old uh, woman with, uh, uh, sorry, a 44-year-old woman with a 24-year-old ovary and her happy baby. There's another leukemia case uh, 15 years earlier. She now has five babies from her frozen tissue. And so what is it that determines, determines ovarian longevity? Well, it turns out it's uh, tissue pressure. And how does that work? Well, our first cases uh, of ovary transplant, we always noticed that when the FSH came down at four or five months, the AMH came up to very high levels and then went down again to very low levels. And it, despite very low levels, these transplants lasted up to 10 or eight or 10 years uh, with a very low ovarian reserve. And there is a composite graph Helen Kolesky did from MIT to show us this is a routine phenomenon after ovary transplant, fresh or frozen. And uh, the question is, what does this mean and what, what is it all about? Well, Nakamatsu actually showed that mechanical stress accompanied with nuclear rotation is what causes the dormant state of these mouse oocytes. And uh, this is kind of a uh, busy slide and I don't have much time, so I'll skip through it. But take a look at this, the dormant follicles that are one ones on the outside that haven't been recruited, the nuclei are gonna be rotating and the recruited oocytes that are moving towards the inside, the nuclei stop rotating. There you can see that rotation is really turning off the recruitment and, and holding those resting follicles in a resting phase so that the woman doesn't lose all her ovaries all at once. She, I mean, she could lose all her eggs all at once if it weren't for this process of making those dormant follicles in the outer cortex. Decreased pressure stops rotation and increased pressure uh, starts rotation. But uh, Nakamatsu took it further with uh, Hayashi and uh, did incubation of in vitro generated oocytes under pressure. And under pressure, nuclei rotated and the, and the oocytes didn't develop. Under mechanical stress and pressure, nuclei rotate, FOX3 goes inside, and you create dormancy. And that's probably one uh, way that stem cells who, which develop very, which might, sorry, which multiply very slowly uh, manage to maintain their lifespan. So what controls the recruitment of follicles and adults from the resting phase? A gradual release from the fibrous cortex, just like in the fetus. And you can see there's a stromal density gradient in the ovary cortex. The most dense stroma on the outside, less dense, and the least dense. And it's that pressure gradient, uh, not really specific hormones that are what's controlling uh, the recruitment of primordial follicles. And this is uh, apparent from a number of clinical studies like Terramoto showed that if you have gigantic numbers of cases like they do in Japan, you can have a pretty consistent graph showing the decline in AMH with age despite variation. But then with all those patients, if you, if you look at them when they're pregnant, in pregnancy, that decline in AMH stops and the AMH stays uh, stable. And uh, that is because we can see that even in the earliest fetus, the uh, oocytes that don't go into the fibrous tissue of the cortex uh, die off quickly. They develop through meiosis, uh, just like in vitro gametogenesis, and then they're gone. And you can see anti-AMH concentrations during pregnancy and postpartum. And it really takes three months postpartum before you begin to see the AMH go up, and that's of course because it takes four months after recruitment uh, for the uh, uh, for the uh, follicles to really reach that antral stage. So tissue pressure is the cause of ovarian longevity, and uh, even during pregnancy, increased abdominal pressure preserves ovarian longevity. And uh, the purpose of the ovarian cortex is to produce dormancy. Now, what's interesting and what led to a lot of confusion about uh, ovarian rejuvenation, and I'll end my talk right, right now with this conclusion, 
is that as the uh, as the pressure, uh, sorry, as the number of oocytes goes down, the rate of primordial recruitment goes down. Uh, it, that is why our ovary tissue with uh, very few viable resting follicles can last eight years because as the ovarian reserve goes down, the rate of recruitment goes down. And once you have uh, a woman who has ovarian failure, uh, her rate of recruitment has gone down so slow that there will still be some oocytes trapped in that ovarian cortex. The rate of recruitment has gone down so slow that when she's almost out of eggs, there's no more recruitment. And this is an example. There are usually a few eggs trapped in the cortex of menopausal women uh, with POF. Now that may only last for two or three years. But the question is, if you uh, reduce that pressure and just chop up that tissue, uh, can you get some of those uh, follicles to be recruited? And of course you can, uh, but that's not over in rejuvenation. That's trying to squeeze out those last few oocytes that weren't able to get out when the woman went into menopause. And this is the famous study from Wallace that proved that. Uh, and uh, the recruitment rate of primordial follicles becomes reduced in parallel to reduced ovarian reserve. So actually we could put in a part of an ovary tissue and uh, it runs out maybe in 48 years and then we put in more and we can maybe get 50 to 100 years of lifetime out of that ovarian tissue uh, simply because it, we're controlling that uh, rate of recruitment. So it's not really ovarian regeneration and you have these follicles that are trapped in most patients with POF for a few years, you can find them. Uh, but it's not over in rejuvenation. Now, I don't have time to talk about in vitro maturation, but uh, we have really, it's spectacular. It, it's so easy now to get uh, anywhere from 13 to 30 M2 oocytes from the ovary tissue before you freeze it. But we run out of time and that's good. We'll, we'll leave that open for a future discussion. So thank you very much, uh, Zev, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it's it's thrilling what we're finding out about the ovary and we're finding out how the ovary works now because of Hayashi's brilliant work uh, in actually in vitro production of uh, gametes from uh, skin cells. Thank you very much, everyone. Sherman, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I have a question for you and I want you to share with us your thoughts. Having a functional oocytes produced from skin. When do you think this will be available for clinical practice? What are we talking about? Well, we've discussed that with our collaborators, uh, Amanda Clark at UCLA, uh, and uh, they, they're very sure by how quickly this has developed and what all we're doing really is applying what Hayashi's already succeeded in doing uh, to the human. And uh, we think it's going to be five years, in, in, in five years, we'll have this figured out and we'll be able to make functional human oocytes from skin biopsy. However, we are sure that it'll be at least five or more years of regulatory uh, studies and approval before this will really be available clinically. So it's the science we're gonna have fairly quickly. The regulation may take longer. And, and I should mention that Obviously, in vitro, to make oocytes uh, from the uh, skin cells, you need to actually incubate the PGCs uh, in fetal granulosa cells. And we're not going to go to abortion clinics or use fetal granulosa cells obtained from uh, abortion. Uh, the only practical way is we have to make fetal granulosa cells from stem cells. So Hayashi's figured this out. In one direction, you make PGCs from uh, stem cells. He's got all the genes figured out. And in the other direction with, with another culture system, you take those same stem cells and you can make fetal granulosa cells. Then you mix the fetal granulosa cells with the PGCs, uh, just like in the mouse, and you get oocytes. So there's no need to have any tissue. All we need are the genes, which Hayashi's figured out now. Uh, to go from uh, stem cell to fetal granulosa cell. So that's why we're pretty sure the timeline is very accurate in about five years. 
What do you think about the experiment, which was done, I think, 20 years ago by Ariel Weissman and Robert Casper, in which they took a piece of a tissue, ovarian tissue, and implanted it under the skin of a denoted mouse and gave him gonadotrophins and recruited an egg? Well, you know, there's no reason why that can't work. Uh, I mean, just a, a mouse, uh, uh, there's been transplants to uh, nude mice for a long time. And uh, we, we don't know whether we're gonna get functional oocytes uh, in the human by doing that. But I don't see a huge, uh, it's interesting, uh, cross species uh, transplants, but I, I don't see a, a huge benefit to that. In other words, what we really want are skin cells from the patient with ovarian failure and the older patient, turn those skin cells into PGCs and turn those PGCs into oocytes. And those oocytes are gonna be extraordinarily young because we've just recreated the, what happens normally in the fetus. So these are the youngest oocytes you can possibly get because we're just recreating what normally happens in the fetus. Sherman, I think we have to stop here this very interesting discussion because of time limit. And I want again to thank you very much for such an interesting presentation. Well, okay. thank you very much. This is uh, the greatest meeting twice a year. Uh, and it's really not only been a great replacement for the absence of meetings with COVID, but I think, I think IVF Worldwide has started something new because we can reach so many more people uh, so much more easily. I think it'll continue on even, if, even when COVID is over. Thank you. Thank you very much.